smart and see which ones have the more impacts. And I'm going to pick on one here, which is coal. And doing this in Pennsylvania is an interesting thing. Coal has very clearly done a lot of good for us. But coal, you can go and find the numbers on how many streams in Pennsylvania don't have brook trout and headwaters in part because they've got acid mine drainage. And that's a loss of economic revenue from fisher persons who aren't up there. And acid rain does make a difference. And you're getting more uranium dumped on your head from coal-fired power plants than you are from any nuclear plant. And mercury deposition influences whether you can eat the fish that you catch or not. I'm catch and release, but some people aren't, right? And land disturbance and particulates and climate change. The economic estimates recently, there's a lot of range in economic estimates, but they are when I turn on the light with coal-fired power, I have to pay the coal company for the electric I use. And if I use that much electric and I pay that much, the estimates are that society pays that much or a little more in addition by having to put up with the acid mine drainage and the mercury and the particulates and the climate change and everything, that the cost of my electric is less than half of the cost to society. And that there's a subsidy when I use coal of what everyone else has to put up with, which is a little more than the cost to me. Like I say, economists, if we got a whole bunch of them in a the room, you will find people that will put that number very low or zero. You will find people put it a lot higher than what I did here. I think this is in the middle of the range of what you'll find, that there really is a subsidy on this because coal, like everything else, has external impacts, and this one may be on the high end. Okay? Now, suppose that you decided that you wanted to do something about that. You could outlaw it. You could say coal is done. You could say, no, let's just get rid of the subsidy. Let's make a, a cost for doing that. Is that an economic disaster? Is that an economic good? What does it mean? Okay. Now, let me do something for you. We tax tobacco. And we tax tobacco because we want to raise money for the government and we want to reduce smoking. And we tax alcohol to raise money for the government and to reduce drinking. And then we tax your wages to raise money for the government and to reduce working. <laughs> okay. So suppose that you said, fine, we're not going to outlaw changing the climate. We're just going to say, if you want to change the climate, you have to pay for that right. And we took that money and we said, we will reduce the tax on your wages. And the government looked at this a couple of years ago, and they said, you know, up to some level, that actually would make the economy grow faster. Okay. Now, I am not telling you that that's the right answer. There's a lot of things to argue about there. But if you hear the energy tax is a disaster, recognize that there are scenarios in which an energy tax would make the economy grow faster. Any tax has impacts. Any tax can raise revenue that can have benefits. You look at the balance. And the idea that somehow taxing it is in and of itself necessarily a bad thing, which you might possibly hear on some commercials, this one said, look, if you tax a bad, changing somebody else's climate, rather than taxing a good, people working, maybe you actually end up better off. Okay. Now, People are very interested in jobs these days. I have worked a little bit for an oil company. Our students from geosciences across the street get jobs from oil companies and coal companies and gas companies. They are good jobs. There's absolutely unequivocally no question that energy companies make good jobs. Anything you spend 10% of the economy on is going to make jobs. And the question might be, where do you get more? And the scholarship is still coming on this, but I think in general, if you look at the scholarship, you'll find that fossil fuels are not the optimal way to make jobs. And do the easy one, okay? The easy target would be the cheapest oil producers in the world can get oil out of the ground and on the tanker to you for something like $5 a barrel. 
and you give them 100. And that $5 is jobs, and the 95 is their ancestors settled on top of oil. Now, they could use that to hire people. They can use that to do jobs, or they could use that to buy your companies or your land, or they could use it to buy bombs, or they could use it to do good for the world, or they could, you know, you have no control on where that money goes afterwards. But the first $5 is attached to jobs, and the rest of it is not immediately attached to jobs. We had, this week, we had guys crawling around in our attic doing some insulation and putting in a more efficient energy system. And they're actually people that are here at this, this festival. And they are local people. And I happen to know that the money we paid them is going into jobs. And that one's actually pretty easy, and they're going into jobs here. And so I've got some, some little references down here that you can't read from the back. But the studies tend to indicate that moving away from fossil fuels ends up with more employment. You spend less on rewarding people who control a resource and more on rewarding people who are working hard. And the economists, again, could argue about this, but think about it. Is your money going to reward people who control a resource, or is it going to reward people who work hard? And it's worth, worth thinking about there. Okay, so what can we do about this? Okay, if we could get a hundredth of a percent of the sunshine, that's all of human energy use, wind, and all, this is what we're using now. We can save a third or so by conservation. The, this is sort of renewable sources. It's out there. Okay, and let me walk you through it. If you put a modern solar farm on an area of the world that's this big, that's all of human energy is. It's a little more, <laughs> okay? And these are things, we, we were having fun doing this out in the Algatones Dune. Uh, Frank Schumann was this Pennsylvania inventor. He was running steam engines on the sun down in Philadelphia 100 years ago, and then he was pumping water out of the Nile before World War I to water the desert with concentrated solar thermal 100 years ago. Um, this worked 100 years ago. They were using it on Cape Cod before that. Uh, is it possible to do this? Sure. Okay. Wind. I, I love this one. Before Lincoln gets elected president, he says, you know, science invention is good for us. Lincoln's the only president who ever held a patent for an invention that he invented. Um, and Lincoln says, you know something? The wind has power. We could capture the wind. One of the greatest discoveries hereafter to be made will be the taming and harnessing of it. Okay? And of course, people are doing that now. And you can still have a ranch underneath the wind turbines. These guys, last summer, in the, the summer before last in the drought, didn't raise any cotton but they didn't lose their ranch because they got ten or fifteen thousand dollars for each one of those turbines on their land and they kept their ranch. Okay. And the truth is if you put a wind farm on the windy parts of the deserts and plains of the world, not in the forest, not in the cities, just the windy parts of the deserts and plains, that's more than all of human energy is. And the cost of that per year for the whole world to build the windmills is less than what we spend a year on energy. And a century ago, when we were building these, if we were building them at a rate that the U.S. would supply a third of the world's energy in 30 years from wind turbines if we build them that fast now. Is this impossible? No, it surely isn't. Okay. Conservation, you'll hear people, like I say, we've got people working on conservation at the house last week, and they'll finish next week. Um, we had fun with this, right? If you... More than 99% of the energy of a candle goes into heat. It doesn't go into light. And if you've got this as a, a Edison flashlight, and, you know, it's 10 times better than a candle, but it's 10 times worse than the LED. And these are New Zealand glow worms, and they're better than the LED. As we, conservation is getting what you pay for. And there are lots of ways that we're learning to get more of what we pay for. And, and the truth is, is that probably, let me back up a second, the truth is, is that, you know, the first 10% is, is way better than free. It pays you to do conservation. Conserving a third is not that hard, okay? Something like that. And it, like I say, there's a lot of people who will have jobs locally. A few other things that you might do, you can do geothermal. It probably involves fracking. 
because you drill a hole and you break some space and you squirt water through and let it come back the other side. Whether that's widely applicable, we'll have to see, but there's a huge reservoir of heat in the rock in the earth that you could use if you figure that out. We're probably never going to run the earth on tides and waves, but if you've got to put a breakwater around the harbor, why not put a generator in it? You know, these things are doing. Whether we're going to do biomass, be perfectly honest, if you watch what's happening to food prices, burning food in a hungry world raises real issues. But there are plenty of people, um, Jim McMillan here at the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, who says, well, why should we burn food? Let's use the corn stalks. You eat the corn, and then we'll, we'll make alcohol out of the corn stalks. That kind of thing will work. Okay. I'll say a word about nuclear. Um, nuclear works. Nuclear is the most likely thing to bring up that'll get people ticked off, one way or the other. Okay. Some people think nuclear is the answer to everything. Other people say, don't you dare do it here. Uh, it is probably the one with the biggest contradictions right now. And it's hard to get communities to move forward when there's contradictions, and those contradictions may not be easy to solve. I have certainly heard many people who want us to use nuclear, but they want to go bomb theirs because they're worried about proliferation, and that's an issue. And I've heard a lot of people who want to use nuclear and who don't want the government meddling, but you better believe the government is meddling because the government really carries the catastrophic insurance and the long-term insurance on nuclear and whatever it is that we decide to do with the waste. So if you really hate the government, you probably are not a big fan of nuclear. Interesting, but at any rate, yes. Um, so, so, you know, my gut feeling is that, that it's going to be, there's a lot of base building before this happens, and it sort of looks like wind and sun are getting cheaper faster. So it's out there, it works, there's no doubt about that, but, but probably, yeah. Now, if you do this, if you say, oh, come on, we're going to do wind and sun, somebody says, wait a minute, um, wind dies, sun sets. You drive into Pennsylvania from, from Washington, and there's the billboard, wind dies, sun sets. All right? Intermittency is not a new discovery, though. Uh, plants burn out, you know, they have to shut them down for maintenance. Engineers have always dealt with intermittency. You've got a cell phone over here, it's got a battery in it, right? You've got a car that essentially has a battery in it, it's just got a tank full of gas. And, and so inter intermittency is an issue, but it's an engineering issue. It is not an insurmountable hurdle. Um, you interconnect larger areas, you get smaller fluctuations, you mix the energy sources. If you're just doing wind and the wind dies, it's an issue. If you've got wind and sun and geothermal and some water, then you've got some more things. And all sorts of options in storage. If you've got a smart grid and a plug-in hybrid with a little biodiesel in the car, okay, you've also got it plugged in. If the electric company needs a little power to run the pacemakers over at the hospital, they can buy it out of your battery, and they give you money for that. And when they've got extra, they put it back into your battery. And if you don't have the electric charge, you got the biodiesel on there, you can drive your car. One estimate was that if you had half of the electric is wind and 3% of the cars are under contract, that the system is stable. So these things are doable. I, I just uh, described a huge deal about having plugs and wires and all sorts of things, but is it impossible? No, absolutely not. Okay. What about the Marcellus? Okay. It is domestic in the short term. It probably helps your balance of payments. If you don't let the gas leak and you replace coal, it lowers global warming. Uh, if you let the gas leak and you add it to coal, it raises global warming. Um, it's not, it's an evolutionary thing from what they've been doing before, but they're moving it into new areas. Um, if it's done with, with best practices, you can probably keep leakage and things to very low levels, um, but that assumes that best practices are being used. Um, keep in mind that so far, the estimates that are out there, some people are talking higher numbers, some are talking lower numbers, but the estimates out there so far is between 25 and 100 years of U.S. energy use at, of U.S. Of US gas at current rates of use. But remember, gas is only a quarter of U.S. energy. So right now, the estimates are out there is that Marcellus is somewhere between sort of five and 25 years of energy. 
if we decided to build an all gas energy system, it's gone before we get the system built. This is not forever. This is not an answer. It is, however, if you want to handle intermittency, gas turbines can start real fast. And if you built a really serious wind-sun system and you say we're going to top it off with gas, then that can last a really long time. And it's, so it's something that if you decided that you want to use this until we're really good with the plug-in hybrids and we're really good with the storage, you could get a huge amount of time out of having gas sitting there ready to spin when you need it. Okay. Now, this is for you. It's not for me. I have been asked this by senators, you know, so what should we do? And, in very polite words, I say, you do your job and I'll do mine. Uh, there's absolutely no question that if you want somebody to measure the C-axis fabric of a thin section of ice from Antarctica, I am better at it than any senator. <laughs> and I think it's equally clear that when it comes to deciding through this, what we believe in, what we care about, what we can do, where we're going, what's national security, what's jobs, what's everything else, I shouldn't tell you what to do, and I won't. I put some particular policy options up here. I am not endorsing any of those, absolutely. What I am endorsing, though, is that it's very clear that we know a lot. The science of this is good. The value of energy to us is outstanding. The options that are available are immense and far more than are needed to get us to a sustainable future that'll get us there. And if we put this together with our brains and the organizers and the organizers and the people you will talk to when you walk out of here and walk around the, the corner and over to next door, we can do better for the future. And pretending that I'm a liar and that all these other scientists are liars are not going to help you any on this one. Don't let us tell you what to do, but let us give you one set of tools in a whole bunch of tools that move us towards a sustainable energy future. So I will leave you with a real rainbow next to a real iceberg. Thank you for what you're doing. Thank you for coming, and I'll take any questions. Alley while we have him here. Come on up to the microphone if you would please. I don't think you need to present your name, but go ahead and speak to the microphone and we'll see what he can come up with. Hello, not really a question, more of an opinion, but you brought up the commuting thing. He bought a commute 30 miles to work, 30 miles to school, 30 miles to the grocery store. Isn't there a way to make that all come to us, automated so to speak, on conveyor belts? <laughs> yeah, th this is it, it is it, this is a good question. It, if you look at conservation, so this is the broadest picture of conservation, and there are things in conservation that are just easy. You change your light bulb, you you know, you turn out the light when you leave the room. These are easy, and they will save a few percent. And uh, you know, one percent is we're sending a trillion a year on energy. So, so 1% is $10 billion a year for the country. So it's real money. The first few percent are just falling off a log easy. Then it gets more difficult. And it does come to, I, I can tell you, and I'm not going to absolutely positively, I will not name names, I will not tell you where, but I have heard an elected official within this region who said, I have a responsibility to automobile commuters. I do not have a responsibility to you on your bicycle. Okay, and not quite in that many words, but almost that many words. Okay, so, um, so, so these things happen. And so once you get past the really easy, let's change our light bulbs and save $10 billion, whatever exactly the number is, the next step, which is how do we plan 
for the future to work well and to do the things you're talking about? How do we plan so that people are working and buying in a more convenient way that saves energy? Okay, you have a little expertise in the room and I don't have that. But you raise the issue that the big savings, so I put a third up there. 10% is easy, 50% is certainly possible, but it gets harder as you go farther. And it takes more thinks, it takes, but it also is jobs. It is inventions, it is companies, it is small businesses, it is, you know, the people that are, that are, Fixing our house right now are a small business, and there are small businesses here. So it's more about centralized infrastructure. It's smart infrastructure. It is including the cost of energy and the likelihood that we would be better off using less of some kinds in the future into the planning. It is adding that to everything else. So it's not letting the energy tell you what you have to do, but it's including that in your thinking. All right, thank okay. you. Seems like close to 50% of the people who are going to vote uh, don't agree with you <laughs> and have serious doubts about global warming and <clears throat> the use of fossil fuels. What is wrong with our educational system? Yeah, so, so, uh, so the, if you didn't hear it in the back there, it, it is, this is a political hot button. And up, I, I could go on at an amazing length here, but um, I, I think what happened, boy, how do I do this? Um, it, it, is, it is very clear that the people who are making decisions now did not learn the physics of radiative transfer in the atmosphere in their high school classes, okay? <laughs> and so most of the people that are making decisions now learned their climate science after they were out in the real world. And a lot of them learned it from people that were promoting particular policies. And because of that, even if the science was right, because it was fairly directly and immediately attract, attached to particular policies, and they didn't get it from their high school teacher in the normal place, they got it you know, out there in the, the hustle bustle of Washington, I think it was easier for some people to reject the science because they didn't like the policies that it was attached to. And so ultimately, I think we just have to go back and say, look, it's physics. We don't know how to avoid this. We can do joules, or we can do kilowatts, and we can do wavelengths. And this is, this is. And it doesn't tell you what to do, but it is. And, and I, I think we're moving in that direction, but there's a, the biggest problem, there's a few educators here, and I think that I will get uh, an agreement that uh, the biggest problem is not what you don't know. The biggest problem is what you know that ain't so. And there's a lot of people now that know a lot that ain't so. And so there's, th this is much harder. Um, if, if we had a blank slate, we'd just do this but we don't have a blank slate now. We have something where people have attached this to things that they really believe in and care about. And my personal belief is that, you know, so I've dealt with this. I, I, I've had people try to get me fired. I have had people say they're watching me. I have had, you know, there, there's some reasonably unpleasant things have come through. Um, I've had uh, someone, you know, I'm an alum and, and I'm trying to get you fired. And, and I send back and I say, first of all, I'm not convinced that your, your behavior and the tone of your letter is exactly co consonant with the, the last verse of the alma mater. Um, <laughs> May no act of ours bring shame to one heart that loves thy name. And, um, but, but if you get past that, you suddenly realize that these are people that actually care very deeply. And they really do want the right thing but they've gotten polarized on it, and, and I am them, I'm not me. And once you get past that polarization and you sit down and say, no, I'm me, and I'm not them, and I'm not world government, and I'm not trying to take away your pickup truck, I'm trying to, to do the right thing, usually the discussion gets very much more interesting, 
And a lot of the people that actually are most contemptuous of global warming are also people who are most interested in conserving because they are conservatives in the old sense of the world, word. And so I think, I don't think things are as bad as they look right now. They look pretty bad right now. But I have a feeling that there is, really is enough goodwill under there and there are enough people that actually sort of get some of these plots that, that this can change. Richard, if I can jump in on this uh, briefly, and I don't mean to steal your thunder. In answer to your question, um, that's really what brought around this festival and what we hope will grow from here is this whole process of educating and opening up minds and spreading information, not just to the crowd here, but when you go out, talk to people. You've got resources coming out of here and other places that you can engage, in pe engage people in conversations not in an emotional laden, you're them, we're us type of di dialogue. But, you know, they've, they've grown up with certain values. I'm old enough, and I know there are other people in this room too, who grew up with the idea that the resources were infinite. We didn't need to care about where we dumped things and what was coming out of our cars or what was, you know, how do we make these changes. You younger generation have actually had a blessing in that you're getting a fresh start. We need you to go out and teach us old dogs some new tricks and we thank you for coming out to the festival and being a part of this and supporting it and taking the things that he's giving with to you and sharing them and going from there and hopefully that's how we change that mindset to one where we work cooperatively for a sustainable future and not competitively for my piece of the pie so to speak okay. any other questions I asked this question to someone outside, but I wanted to hear what your response was. Does Moore's Law apply to solar cells? And if so, where do you think that's going to cap? So Moore's Law apply to solar cells. So, so as essentially, what is it, a doubling of computer speed every two years or whatever the number the was and having the price. So, so it is very clear that, that solar has been getting better, and it's been getting better very fast. Um, it is... And I don't think I'm enough of a technologist to tell you, but the energy is there. And so I expect that it will get better for a lot while longer. I certainly hope it will. Um, it is already, you know, the, the, the glib thing in solar is grid parity. So at what point is solar making energy that's as cheap as what's in the grid now? And the ways to, you know, one way to get to grid parity is to, price what's in the grid now so it's not subsidized. Um, and that would, if that were done, there'd be a lot more grid parity already. Um, because, like I say, if somebody pays half of my electric bill, mine's cheap, right? <laughs> okay. So, so we're, we're getting, there are places and times that it's already there. And there are certain, you, you, you start to see, you know, you drive down the interstate and there's a solar cell on the, the weather station that's that's telling you if the road is frozen and they need to get the salt trucks out and you know our colleagues over here Sridhar and Don and Peter are building solar powered instruments that they're deploying in Antarctica and it works and they're sure as heck not going to connect the cable from a plant here in Pennsylvania they, they're going to do it with solar and so there are places and times that it's already there um, they're building these very interesting things with storage in the solar system. So in the, I forget if it's the second or third hour of our show, they've got the, this great solar set of solar cells in, in, over in Sevilla and um, in Spain and in the second one. And it's, it's this glorious thing. If you ever, it, it looks cool. Right, because it's one of these concentrated things. So they take the mirrors and they focus them on this thing and you can see the beams of light reflected off the mirrors. And in that, they've got molten salt. And so they take the heat and they heat it up from the sun in the day and then they can make electric at night. And you know, this is, this is so, so, so far we don't see a, see a plateau, but eventually physics is physics. So eventually it has to bite you, but how soon, I'm not sure. But it's a, it's a very good question. But so far, it's getting there. So far, the things are very long-lived, you know. So people were costing these out and finding uh, that they're lasting a little longer than a lot of the costing had been done. I like to, I've got a little solar-powered calculator. And I bought this little solar-powered calculator in 1984. 
so I could take it to Greenland. And I, I was digging these snow pits, and I was working in the snow pit, and I could calculate things while I was working on the ice in Greenland, and it worked. It sort of blew, and the thing worked. And it still does, right? And I had five battery-powered calculators that the batteries have all gone on. <laughs> but this one still works, OK? So, so yes. All right. All right. So I don't have the 